some of the issues that was, were raised in a, an earlier talk about revitalizing plant science and also uh, there's a world of expertise up here and so any students who have questions about teaching or career opportunities, I think this is, we give you priority and, and maybe you can ask some questions if you have some. Done? Okay. So maybe I should pose a question to the panel, you know, um, uh, reflecting back on a couple ideas that we heard earlier when, when we had our, our talk, talking about the very few people actually work and live in rural areas now. And I think that's maybe reflected in the surveys that you had at Hope College about how few students are uh, interested in plant biology. Um, it might be interesting, I, I increased the number of plant biology majors by 25% last week because we went from three to four. <laughs> I signed somebody up uh, when, during advising. So, you know, you, you had some ideas earlier, maybe if you want to expand on it or other panel members would like to comment on, you know, sort of mechanisms to get students interested because I think probably for the vast, vast, vast majority of our students, their interaction with plants is being forced to mow the lawn on the weekend in the summer. And so, you know, they don't appreciate the kind of technology that's going on and the interesting things that are developing in, in agriculture or the studies of ecosystems. So maybe if panel members wanted to comment on maybe some suggested uh, ways to get students interested. I mean, two, two parts from my um, perspective is I think, um, in the pu there's an enormous public debate about the role of food, the role of land use, the role of agriculture. And I would think that you can engage in that debate from the perspective of plants and the perspective of agriculture in many, in many venues. And that's why I asked the question about, you know, the intersection of, of English, the intersection of history with plant biology. So I think that you could leverage the debate a little bit more to drive interest. And then Second of all, from the technology side, my primary interactions are usually with computer scientists, uh, statistical geneticists, uh, an enormous swath of technologists. So there's room for engagement with um, a broad range of um, the non-humanities sectors as well. Um, since coming to, um, to Hope College, it, I kind of, um, in the past, the first couple, a few years, I uh, taught introductory biology, which has, um, we used to have two courses, uh, three introductory courses, organism of biology, ecology and evolution in cells and, uh, and genetics. And um, so in the organism semester, we actually focus on plants and animals. So I tried really hard and to try to, um, Increase the interest of students into uh, plant science. We did, you know, have students to have activities so in the class. They will kind of um, uh, do performance, showing you know double fertilization process and things like that. And they had projects. Um, they have a band that actually, uh, you know, they, they go up there and then just sing songs about plants and things like that. Um, but when you get to, um, of course, that expands a little bit in terms of botanic education and trying to get them interested. But when you get to the upper level courses, still, um, there is a lack of interest in plant biology. So um, that's why I've been kind of think about why that's the case and, and how we can actually improve in that area. And a lot of talks here really give me some ideas. Um, but at the end, I f I, that's why I did a survey. And it, it, it seems to be true in many other liberal arts colleges as well. But the problem is this. If we have 80% of the st students coming into a biology program thinking about pre-med, at the end, we may actually have only probably a third or less students really that can actually go on to medical school, dental school, or public health areas. So that means we need to really give them much broader training in the biological programs, including plant sciences. And that's why I want to hear your opinions and ideas and suggestions. Well, 
just add to those with two quick comments. So going back to what you mentioned about you know urbanization and most people growing up without access to nature, I think it's up to us at colleges and I think maybe liberal arts colleges have even greater opportunities to think about um, very creative field-based courses. We're quickly losing those from our curriculum and even at the college level, that's still a formative enough stage that students can reconnect with nature. Um, and then, yeah, through my involvement here with the Sustainable Food Systems Initiative, I think that's really low-hanging fruit at a lot of institutions in terms of, you know, we all eat, and that's an easy way um, to suck people into thinking again about plants, as you were just saying, Sasha. Um, but it can be done through a broader perspective. So when we started that initiative here, there was some pushback saying, well, there'll be turf wars with MSU just up the road. You know, what is the role of a non-land grant in thinking about food and agriculture? Um, and I think we've done a nice job here of a broader food citizenship framing, just thinking about this idea that as eaters, we all need to know at least the basics of where our food comes from and how to sustain those ecosystems that sustain us. Um, and it doesn't mean that we have to specialize in the same areas of production that MSU does, but we can offer a really wide range of courses related to our food and agricultural systems. So that is a nice opportunity for getting students to re-engage and then maybe they would find their passion for another area um, like we heard in all of the talks today. I guess when I think of plant biology in a plant science major, I, I do think of MSU. Um, and um, because there's so much applied research search toward agriculture. And when, when I think of uh, the program that I'm in, in the college that I'm in, LSA, uh, we're, we're more interested in liberal arts education. And uh, my feeling is, is what is being potentially lost is uh, the natural history aspect of the education. And so, from my perspective, it's less important for students to become uh, plant science majors than to become uh, ecologists or, or evolutionary biologists. And so I've actually, uh, even though we've recently merged administratively our museum of zoology and our herbarium, and um, uh, I actually think that's a good thing in a way because there's a lot of commonality across these natural history um, disciplines and a lot that we can learn from one another. And you can't really study ecology without knowing something about the animals. And so uh, I guess it may be a devil's advocate position that maybe uh, like the plant biology major is not something that I would push for. Um, <clears throat> coming from my perspective, I would say you guys at U of M have an excellent engineering program right up the hill. And to be able to marry that with plant sciences may be a great thing to think about, um, especially from a material science perspective. So some of the challenges in synthetic biology are how you, how you pattern cells, um, not only for tissue regeneration and scaffolding, which is more on the medical side, but also for just plain structural purposes. And so I think about you guys in my old department all the time when we're thinking about patterning cells because I learned a lot in, in plant cell biology about how, how plants do that. Um, so that aspect is definitely something to think about. You know, NASA runs a great um, biology program. There's going to be needs in the future for thinking about growing plants in space, plants on Mars, all that kind of stuff. They're investing in that right now. So. Did you want to comment on M we've met MSU's been mentioned like five times, so yeah. I maybe I'll give you a chance to. Is this on? Yeah. yeah. So um, I think MSU is thinking along the, the same lines with the food um, system. You know, the, the president launched um, a big food initiative um, fairly recently at MSU. And, you know, we do have that ag school land grant. Um, thing going on there, um, but I, I spent a little bit of time before I came here um, talking to the person in my department who is the academic advisor. She's like the point person for when students actually come and um, they, we're trying to recruit those students. That, that advisor is the first person that um, students and their families would, would typically um, me and she said that by and large almost every single um, person that they're not really so interested in the 
academic side of things when they're thinking about um, what they're going to get into in school. When the families come, they're like, is my kid going to get a job in this? And what opportunities are out there for, for a career when, you know, in horticulture or in plant science? And I think that um, that's something that um, maybe we don't address at an earlier stage or maybe is not addressed early enough in the, in the school systems to, to get um, people who um, you know, are advising um, high school kids on careers as to what, what's actually out there for someone who's, who's actually interested in, in plants. And so um, when I spoke to, and her name is Susan Gruber, and when, when I spoke to Susan before I came here, she said that's the number one concern because particularly for students, you know, maybe coming from uh, a more disadvantaged background, maybe their first generation college, the, the family wants to know, is this a viable career? If, if my student is academically capable, why aren't they going to medicine or, you know, um, law or engineering or something, right? So plants is kind of a, it's a hard sell, I think.
your love. So my question is that from your background, when you see uh, in the last, say, uh, 20 years, the number of jobs that require financial related experts going up or three times or going down. And the second part of that is that the students we produce, undergrad, master, PhD students, do they meet your requirements? I guess I'm holding the mic, so I'll start. <laughs> I, I got into this field because of my time in the herbarium in my small liberal arts college and my time hiking the mountains of uh, Idaho as I was growing up. Um, so I, I definitely came from the perspective that a lot of us here are talking about. Monsanto as a company, we don't, we really don't, it, even if you look at breeding, we don't hire breeders anymore, and that's not specifically plant biology, we hire data scientists. And so the, the specific disciplines of mechanistic plant biology and even plant breeding are, are less in demand. Um, but plants provide, plants are an amazingly accessible organism of which to study any field and it's an amazing accessible place for, for big data analytics. And so I think that there's a, 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 a strong need for um, people with diversity in their talents. And that's where sometimes I worry that um, we're not preparing our students appropriately. Um, you know, I'd love to see people with a plant biology degree but are quite adept at, at picking up Perl or Python and, and, and being able to code and being able to have that flexibility of talent. And then as my job has changed constantly so that what I came into the company with has, it's changed. And so the ability for your students to have a diversity of talents is really important. Um, I'd agree with that. I think um, our labs are very multidisciplinary, and so I have never put a job out for a plant biologist, but nor have I for a biologist. We're looking for people with, with broad skills, specific skills, um, microbiology, molecular biology, biochemistry, and you know, quite frankly, I don't care what what the subject matter is that they started in. You know. I, I did my PhD in plant cell biology, I went on to marine biology, but the, the underlying, the underpinning part of all of that is knowing what questions to ask in mo with molecular type tools, knowing what to manipulate from a biotechnology perspective, and it doesn't really matter what kind of organism you're looking for and at, if you can read the literature, if you can, if you can um, work with other people, um, if you can communicate well, um, that's really what, what we look for, so. I just, I just think liberal arts schools are in the best position of anybody to provide the talent of the future because of that. I guess I'd go back to no matter what your background, you need to communicate well. You need to know how to ask a scientific question and come up with a research plan. Um, you know, whether you're a plant biologist or a microbiologist, uh, you, you have to know how to do all that stuff. There's, I agree with you that big data is a huge part of everything right now. And so the extent that you can embrace that part the extent to which you can become multidisciplinary and learn to talk to other people outside of your field, which is exactly why I brought up the engineering thing. If you could come up with a joint project with somebody in engineering, you know, I was part of the um, cellular biotechnology training program as a graduate student, and um, you know, that was all about how to talk to other people. Um, and my project had nothing to do with that, but it taught me, you know, how to how to talk to engineers, how to talk to um, biologists and mathematicians and chemists, and that's really what it's all about. Uh, 
Oh, goodness. Um, okay, if we're getting into the weeds here, I think, uh, I think, you know, you have to market yourself appropriately to whatever job you're applying to, I guess, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't dissociate yourself from your background. If you're, you know, if your major's in plant biology, you say you're in, in plant biology, but you have to come up with a CV and a cover, cover letter and letters of recommendation that reflect that you are broader than plant biology, if that makes sense. So. Well, you mean biological benefits or? Um, <clears throat> well, for me, it's um, there, there's something intrinsically exciting about uh, discovering a new species. And um, in the case of these, uh, these trees down in central Brazil, uh, in this plot that I was working in, uh, the 100 hectare plot, uh, about 30% of the species, the 40 species, uh, have been described since 1972. So they're very newly described species. And so um, all of those, I mean, I wouldn't be able to do the larger analysis uh, using the phylogeny and the biogeographic reconstruction uh, without being able to add those species into the overall uh, analysis. And, um, and some of those species, like one of them, is so evolutionarily distinct from everything else that it's probably gonna be a new genus. And, um, and so far, its geographic range is only this small area around the city of Manaus, Brazil. So that has some pretty interesting implications in terms of, of conservation. So if we think about these taxa and their distinctiveness um, and how little we know about them, we really, we can make the case that we really don't know what we're destroying when we deforest. And, um, and there's downstream things. If something is very evolutionarily distinctive, it can have all kinds of secondary compounds that are distinctive from other trees. This could be interesting for exploration you know, of discovery of new, new chemistry, potentially new medicines. Um, these could have different qualities and traits that would be associated for timber or any other use. They could have animal associations that are distinctive. So there's a whole cascading range of things that, that accompany the discovery of a new species. Um, but it really takes like making the specimen and, and, and first looking at it in an herbarium and, and describing a new species based on that what we call type specimen uh, that gets the process rolling. So I'm, I'm kind of a, ba a bad botanist in that sense because um, I don't actually describe the species, but I will uh, provide them to my collaborator, Scott Moore at the Botanical Garden. He will describe them and then he will provide a, a Latin name. And it, since he is the author of that la new Latin name, his name will go at the end of that. So he will get credit because anybody that ever mentions that species in the literature has to mention his name. So th there's kind of a credit in that way, but. No monetary credit. You mean like in terms of GMO, genetically modifying or? Modifying plants? Um, does anybody else know? Would it be MCDB or? CMB. That'll give you the most genetic and molecular biology. MCDB? CMB. Oh, CMB. You email it to the MCD department and they just send it. Okay, CMB. Historical taxonomy. What was that stand for? Cellular and molecular biology. Okay.
we did not plan. So here's the, pro here's the challenge in terms of the pharmacy area. So if it's, if it's a medicine, pharmaceutical drug medicine, that's a totally different. So um, there's very few really proved plant or natural product medicine, although some of them are from there. Uh, in this country, the research is not there either. So really, the, the, from a student or training point of view, is not there. So that's a pharmaceutical science. However, in our teaching, we just generate, we just created a bachelor for pharmacy, bachelor for science in pharmaceutical science. So, however, we did not build the paternity medicinal plant into the curriculum. So that's not traditionally not in the not not in the Western Western medicine curriculum. So that's why we did not build. So if you create a course, they may be interested. So that's in terms of teaching. Um, in, the problem is in terms of research. So if you don't have enough faculty in this field, don't have enough funding, that's gonna be the major problem. Compared to Asian country in China, the, the, the government put a huge amount of funding resource into medicinal plant, purification, efficacy study. This country is very minor. So that's another problem. However, I do have a question. I'm searching the, I'm searching, I'm searching the internet. One area I don't know who's covering it is a dietary supplement. We definitely don't cover it. That's not in pharmacy area. And uh, we, uh, from FDA point of view, we all say that need to be regulated. However, what I heard, that industry is very, very powerful. They just resistant to the regulation. Therefore, you can make it very easy to put in the, the, the CVS to sell it. But I actually don't know who, who's current, where's the educational program cover that? So, so where, I'm sure they have, a, I just searched, they have like $120 billion market. So maybe in next 10 years will be 200 billion. But then I'm assuming there's a lot of a plant, a lot of extraction. Our students don't go there. The food science and nutritional, I, I, don't, I don't know food science people go there either. We don't in our teaching for PharmD pharmacy student. We don't cover the dietary uh, dietary supplement uh, part. We we don't have somebody to teach. We don't have the curriculum. We we may touch a little bit, but that's the whole area we don't cover. The nutritional science, public health, they, their program is very new also. The, I think I talked to them also a few times. My understanding is they are more on food nutritional, very, very, not very much in dietary supplement. So I think that's the area. I don't know the plant biology, whether you want to cover the dietary, <laughs> dietary uh, supplement area. I, I know we don't cover it. That's not our field. Uh, I don't know whose field is that. They, they have an employment, they have a job, uh, but I have no, no idea how, how that. But in nutritional science, I must be much longer and better started than that. So we, we have food science and human nutrition. I, that's a curriculum that I, I only have a very limited understanding of. It's a different department to, to my department. I have 
um, taught a number of their students for, for one of the classes that, that I teach, um, but they are very focused on kind of food product. There's a lot of food production process, right? You know, like how to process fruits and vegetables, how to process meat. You know, it, it's really the mechanics. Um, I, I guess the, the nutrition part of the, the food science and nutrition um, department, it's that nutrition part is the part that I'm less familiar with. But I was just trying to think here, I don't even think at MSU we have a class, even in any of the plant biology departments, that um, focuses on medicinal plants specifically. Now, I know that there is a huge interest from the students in this area. And the biggest area, obviously, that they're interested in is cannabis growing. Okay? So my department particularly, we get a lot of students that, I mean, just in general, they want to grow something. They want to be small farmers. They want to grow fruits and vegetables. But there's also quite a significant amount. I have a kid in my class at the moment. He runs some of these growing facilities for medical marijuana. But we are not allowed to teach. It's come from the, the, uni the university. We are not allowed to teach any classes that um, go down that line about um, that aspect of um, you know, production of those, those crops. But that in the, within the state and the, the legalization, you know, there's a, there's a whole big industry that's, that's going to come that's going to need, like, extension support, just like the fruit and vegetable growers need ex extension support. Yeah, I was just going to build on this a little bit to say that, you know, I think there is hope that there are a growing number of jobs for people who are thinking in a more systemic way about links between plants and sustainability and plants and human health. And I think part of our challenge in staying relevant is not thinking necessarily about courses we need to fill particular market niches, but um, perhaps reflecting on the ways in which reductionism has gotten us into this mess in a little bit and then how we can get back out of that. So I've, my understanding from some colleagues in nutritional sciences is that they would not recommend dietary supplements a lot of the time. They would recommend eating the actual food, right? And that that's a more effective way to actually absorb that nutrition and, and have it um, result in a, an appreciable health impact. So I think thinking creatively too about how we can, I, I think we have to balance a little bit. There's been a lot of discussion of um, you know, students are thinking practically about how do I get a job, and a lot of them are probably thinking how do I make the most possible money, but for that subset of students that really is thinking in other terms about, you know, making a difference in the world or what are their values, I think there are things we can offer for them um, from a more systemic perspective. Uh, we got a couple minutes left. I want to bring, Cora teaches our introductory plant biology course, so what, what's your experience because you have a, a number of, you actually have a significant number of students in there. I don't know how many are interested in plants, but you know, maybe you can tell us what you've seen there. Uh, so I teach Bio 230, which is Introductory Plant Biology. Um, so it's a 200 level class, but sort of surprisingly about three quarters of the students are seniors. Uh, and I haven't come up with a diplomatic way to ask them, what are you doing here if you're a senior and you're planning on going to dental school? But uh, um, I think they're looking for something that is relatively uh, fun and interesting and maybe a break from their much more um, rigorous and a little bit reductionist um, requirements for getting into med school. Um, so we, we try to keep things relatively uh, interesting and not focus so much on the things that are uh, very conserved across all of life, but talk about the interesting plant examples and how plants do things differently and how you might not uh, things that you might not otherwise get if you were just taking intro bio and sort of the core, uh, sort of molecular genetic courses of, of the components. But there, I definitely get some really good questions. Um, so there's some people there who I'm sure are there for a relatively easy, relatively good grade, and there's some people there that are interested because they're, they're just inherently interested. And I think we're, we're always going to have a difficult challenge uh, getting students that are interested in plants because if they know they're interested, they're much more likely to be looking at Michigan State or other agricultural schools. Um, 
and the students that we do get tend to be much more medically focused. So there's this relatively narrow window of students that we have sort of the opportunity to get excited and interested in plants. But that's sort of the, the track that I'm taking is to just talk about how plants are cool and let them sort of just enjoy plant biology. Yeah, you know, I think some of us, I think the conundrum you face is the more reductionistic somebody is when they come out of school, the more ready they are for an immediate job as they come out. Um, the broader they are, the more they're going to be a leader. But that, that wage earning, the, the people who have an engineering degree will probably have a higher wage earning the first five years that they get out of de their degree. The people who take a broader, more liberal arts approach, they're going to have a longer ramp and they're going to be the, the future leaders. And I don't know how, how you make that case, um, but I think that's, that's part of the challenge. So let me, just two parts to this. So we have two different ways of bringing people into the company. We have specific roles, and then we have a, a program that we actually use for a lot of people coming in called Emerging Leaders in Science. It doesn't matter what you're at, you're, you're doing, you just have to have been good at it, right? And so we brought in people who are really good at, at, at songbirds, right? Yeah. And so it, that the idea is that people who have shown um, talent are able to apply that talent elsewhere. Talented people are talented. Um, and then as you rise up in the company, we, we move around a lot. And so often the people running one area have no formal training in that area. But you know, you don't stop learning once you get a job. You learn while you're in the job. So my space, I, I run the, um, a large IT group for molecular genotyping for the breeding program. My background was botany and Arabidopsis genetics. So I have no background in what I do. Uh, and that's where I kind of look back, way back to my liberal arts education, where I had probably just as many history courses and art courses as I did biology courses. And, and I think that that's where breadth comes from. But certainly in the senior letters, levels of leadership, there's um, not, not much correlation between your formal training and what your role is. All right, I think we've almost hit 320. So uh, what's next? So, uh, there we, uh, we have a reception outside. 